is so paisay. <laughs> Only Malaysians use several titles. <laughs> sister will do, I'm very comfortable with sister. Drop the doctor. <laughs> It gives people a wrong impression. Somebody gets a heart attack, I don't know what to do. I'm not that type of doctor. <laughs> okay, just now, Brother Fong mentioned uh, briefly what today's talk is about. Um, we won't be covering so much because there isn't time. Like birthdays, weddings, it has been taken out because we don't have time to cover that. But we can discuss during Q&A if there are any questions. Okay? So I hope I didn't delay your talk because I was caught in a massive uh, traffic jam. I left home at 7.25 and that's just Subang Jaya, can you imagine? It took me half an hour to get out of Subang Jaya. <laughs> okay, let's start the talk. So we're going to talk about festivals, funerals and feng shui. Uh, basically, we're going to see uh, how as Chinese, Chinese are plenty of festivals, right? I did one complete talk on festivals alone and I realized every month we Chinese have one festival. So today we're not talking about all of them, just the major festivals. So we have so many festivals and it's part of our Chinese culture. So as a Chinese, some of you may want to observe all these festivals. So we're going to look at some of these festivals and see how we can give it a Buddhistic flavor. Because we are Chinese, we are Buddhists as well. So some of these practices that we do, let us examine today whether it is uh, in line with our Buddhist precepts or not. And then if it is not, maybe some of the practices we may want to reduce or we want to drop. I want to introduce a more Buddhistic practice into this kind of festivals. Okay? So we're going to start with festivals first. Now, before we start, um, our cultural traditions are very much influenced by the three major religions in China. So the three major religions would be Confucianism, Taoism, that is China-grown religions. Yeah, Confucianism stresses a lot of filial piety, good governance and so on. Taoism, uh, the actual teachings by Lao Tzu actually stresses on living in harmony with nature. Taoism is actually about that. But what happened was, after Lao Tzu passed away, Chinese people made up a lot of rituals and called it Taoism. Actually those rituals, nowadays you hear of Taoist priests, or the Tou Tao, you know, the Taoist priests, what they do, all the rituals that they do, actually had nothing to do with Lao Tzu's actual teachings. Lao Tzu's actual teachings was just how to live in harmony with nature. That's all. So after that, the Chinese people created a lot of rituals. So nowadays, you hear people saying anything that's ritualistic, they say, oh, it's Taoism. Actually, it's not Taoism in its pure form. It's the Taoism created by all these people after Lao Tzu passed away. So Taoism, as taught by Lao Tzu, is just living in harmony with nature. And then, of course, you have Buddhism that came to China about 500 years after the Buddha passed away. So Buddhism was brought to China. So you see, the cultural practices of China is very much influenced by these three major religions. Right? So we're going to look at festivals now. So what is the most important festival of the Chinese? Of course, it's Chinese New Year. Okay, the first uh, festival of the year, of the Chinese Lunar Year. So Chinese New Year begins with Chinese New Year Eve, which is the reunion dinner. <laughs> okay, this is a picture of a typical reunion dinner. You see the dishes are all numbered. Because some Chinese believe that you must have many, many dishes and you must eat many, many kinds of different meat. I talk to some Chinese, they say, yes, you must have this and that and all kinds of different meat. So, uh, as a Buddhist now, how do you observe your reunion dinner? Lavishly like that? What did the Buddha talk, teach us about eating? We eat for sustenance of the body so that we can maintain the holy life, isn't it? We don't eat for intoxication, not for enjoyment, not for duty and not for all these things. So as a Buddhist, maybe you wouldn't want to eat so lavishly because I see a lot of families eating a reunion dinners, there's a lot of wastage. A whole lot of wastage after that. So wasting food is not Buddhistic. So even we, we do have a reunion dinner and a family comes back and everything, yes, you do have something a little bit more special than normal, but let us remember not to waste food. Let us remember to <clears throat> that we are eating just to sustain this body, yeah, to practice the holy life. And one more thing that you may want to do is the Chinese cultural practice is must have a lot of meat, but you know meat comes from slaughtered animals. So you may want to reduce that also. Yeah, some families go on vegetarian, some may not want to, but you can reduce the amount of meat. 
You know why? Because the chain effect is there. The butchers know, oh, reunion dinner, these Chinese are going to eat a lot of meat, all types of meat, chicken, fish, mutton, crab, prawns, whatever it is. So the butchers know, the market people know they're going to slaughter more. So indirectly, we are causing them to slaughter more. Right? So you're causing them to break the first precept of killing. So these are things that you may want to consider as a Buddhist for the reunion dinner. Right. Then, there's this practice of welcoming the god of fortune. How many of you do this? A family tradition still does this? Oh, done. Okay, good. <laughs> Some families, the older generation, they still want to continue this practice. So if it's the family tradition to continue this practice for the sake of tradition, then, you know, just to please the elders, you may be forced to do it. But then if you have a say, you know this one may add on to our greed, right? Because when you talk about fortune, it's usually not good fortune as in, um, um, <clears throat> you know, good fortune, whenever Chinese talk about fortune, it is money, it is wealth. Yeah? It's relying on these things for more money to come in, so it increases our greed. So you don't long, no longer practice this, that's good. When your family insists because of tradition to please the elders and so on, then you just do it for the sake of tradition and not to increase our greed. Okay, the first day of Chinese New Year begins with... What does it begin with for you? For some families, it begins with this tea ceremony. This tea ceremony where the younger generation pays respect to the elder generation. How many of you all practice this? Oh, okay, that's nice. So if you practice this, this is good because it's filial piety. It's paying respect to the elders. And then when they serve tea, the younger ones serve tea, they get their ang pao. Right. The ang pao is another big question mark. <laughs> because children have gone very materialistic now, right? Yeah, Children have gone very materialistic and they always compare which uncle or auntie gives more. Then we're increasing their sense of materialism. So one way to combat this is to insist, to, to teach children that the ang pao is a token, but more important is to wish. So as elders, when you give ang pao, make sure you proceed with the wish. Always give the child a wish first. That means the wish is more important than the ang pao. Okay? The ang pao is just a token. Okay? All right? So it starts with the wish. Wish them something like good health or success in their studies, something. Make the wish a little longer so that they pay attention and listen to the wish. <laughs> so the wish is more important than the money. That money, that, that piece of red paper is just a token. Okay? Emphasize on that. Otherwise, a lot of children get very greedy. It increases the weight because all they think about is how much inside. Okay, so the tea ceremony is a good practice. So if you have that in your family, it's good to continue. So we talk about ang pao. Uh, then the next picture there shows playing cards, gambling, which is part of the tradition of Chinese New Year. <clears throat> All right. So with young children, please be very careful because uh, sometimes because of Chinese New Year, when they gamble, they play cards. Then gambling becomes part of the habit. They can develop that habit. And gambling, as you know, in the Sitalo Vada Sutta is a vice. The Buddha said it's very, very foolish. Some young children actually pick up gambling from Chinese New Year, playing cards. Because it's a tradition, everybody does it. Every house they go to, they gamble. Okay, and then they just pick up this habit. I remember when we were young, when I was young, my father was totally against gambling. Absolutely. Uh, until he went to the extreme of forbidding us to even have cards in the house. So we had no cards in the house at all, not allowed to. We had those children's game cards. <laughs> like we were not allowed to have this type of cards in the house. My father was totally against gambling. Okay, so keep an eye on the children, yeah? because they can pick up these bad habits. And then gambling is unbuddhistic. Okay, then some families will choose Chinese New Year as a time for the whole family to come together to do dana. Some sort of charity work, whatever it may be. Okay, maybe usually visiting old folks' home or orphanages or some sort of charity work. And that should be continued. That is a good way to celebrate any festival, you know, to think of the less fortunate. And then when you think of the less fortunate, humans as well as those uh, less folks, yeah, those uh, stray animals in your neighborhood, yeah, they also need charity. I noticed during Chinese New Year, a lot of people will just leave their pets in the porch because they go back to the hometown. So they leave their pets there with a bowl of water and a big bowl of food. Sometimes they are left there for a whole week. 
Okay? And then if you are not going anywhere, you are around there, you may want to, like what I did, buy fresh 